and welcome. Charlton Comics is an interesting anomaly in comic book history, mainly due to its longevity and the noticeable lack of an impact it had on the industry during its 40-year existence. Charlton wasn't a completely irrelevant presence, but, at the same time, it existed in a comfortable niche, seemingly content with its status as a publisher of B-grade genre comics. In many respects, Charlton Comics was somewhat unique in the comic book publishing field. Every aspect of the business was done in-house. It was the only company that produced, printed, and distributed their own material. Charlton was, quite literally, a two-story factory that mass-produced comic books and magazines. It's also believed that the company owned a lumber mill that produced the paper for their printed product, although this point may simply be a rumor. Another unique, less flattering distinction is that Charlton paid the least to the creative talent. Furthermore, their production value was, objectively, the worst in the industry. Regardless of the content inside the comic itself, a Charlton book looked cheap. The paper was a low-quality, slightly off-color newsprint, and the reproduction of the artwork inside was adequate. Unlike all the other major publishers of the era, Charlton was not based in New York. Its factory was in Derby, Connecticut, although the company did borrow office space in New York to acquire and pay for work done by freelancers. Finally, Charlton paid for work upon completion. If a freelance artist or writer turned in pages, they were cut a check right away. Staff writers and artists were paid weekly. So for those struggling to make ends meet, some hastily finished pages for Charlton meant a guaranteed income. This was not true of the other major publishers, who usually didn't pay until weeks or months had passed. Unfortunately, because of the quality of their comics, the low pay they offered the talent, and the origin of the company itself, Charlton has always had a somewhat unsavory reputation. The publishing company began in 1935, and it was founded by two men who met in prison. Coincidentally, both men had sons they had named Charles, thus the inspiration for the name of the eventual company, Charlton. The one founder, John Santangelo, wound up in jail for multiple copyright violations. He had been illegally printing and selling lyrics to popular songs, without compensating the creators of the lyrics. The other founder, Ed Levy, was a disbarred attorney who was given a jail sentence for his involvement in a billing scandal. Following their release from prison, they joined together and started a publishing venture. Originally, they licensed and printed lyrics to popular songs in the successful music industry magazine, Hit Parader. Basically, they continued the business model that had sent one of them to prison in the first place. Of course, this time they approached it in a proper legal manner. Eventually, in 1946, they expanded the business into publishing comic books. Their initial titles were Funny Animal and Western Books, but soon included crime, romance, and horror comics. In fact, one of their titles, The Thing, was cited in the infamous anti-comic novel The Seduction of the Innocent. As the anti-comic crusade continued throughout the 50s, and many companies went out of business, Charlton acquired the rights to many of the characters initially used by these defunct companies the most notable of which was the acquisition of characters from Fawcett Publications. This was the company that had great success with the character Captain Marvel. When the company closed its comic book division, it sold off all of its characters to Charlton, except for those in the Captain Marvel family, of course. The Captain Marvel characters were basically poisoned at this time anyway, due to the lawsuit DC filed claiming that Captain Marvel was a rip-off of Superman. It was during this period that a new artist began his career, Steve Ditko. Ditko worked on, well, anything he was given, but it was horror titles where he really gained notoriety. He split his time freelancing for Charlton and the precursor to Marvel Comics, Atlas Comics. At roughly the same time, another artist began his career, Dick Giordano. Like Ditko, Giordano worked on anything he was given and eventually became a staff artist, then an assistant editor at Charlton. According to Giordano, when he started at the company, Charlton offered a low but somewhat reasonable page rate to the talent. Early on, though, the page rate was lowered for no other reason than the publisher wanted to make more profit. Because the comic book industry was in such a bad state, due mostly to the anti-comics crusade, and finding work was difficult at best, Charlton was able to offer their talent very little other than a steady paycheck for their efforts. To give you an idea of how low the pay was, writers made $4 a page, while artists made $13 a page. This was less than half the rate offered by Atlas or DC. Then in 1955, the Charlton factory was flooded. The printing facility was literally submerged underwater and required nearly a year of repairs before it started operating again. 
In the interim, the company continued on as normally, although the printing was farmed out to other companies. Following this flood, Charlton cut its page rate in half, claiming this was necessary to keep the company going. The implication being the repairs to the machinery were costly and the company needed the extra profit to stabilize, or they would simply go out of business. This was a bit of a shady claim, though. The owners had managed to acquire disaster relief for the flooded facility, and they weren't paying out of pocket for the repairs. Furthermore, once the repairs were complete, and the factory was operating at full capacity again, the page rate remained unchanged. In fact, until the company eventually closed, the page rate barely went up at all. According to Joe Gill, the prolific staff writer who wrote almost everything Charlton printed, and who remained with the company throughout its comic book history, after the flood he was given $2 a page for his writing. By the time the company folded operations in the late 70s, he was making just under $7 per page. This was about a third of the industry standard. The natural question one might ask is, why would anyone work for such a low rate? Well, as previously mentioned, work was scarce, and a little paycheck was better than none at all. Secondly, as Joe Gill once pointed out, as long as the story was mostly coherent and didn't violate the comics code, no one really cared about the quality of the story or the artwork. So one could crank out a pile of work, get some money, and never be bothered by editors who wanted changes to the material. In many respects, it didn't matter what was on a page. All that mattered was a page was produced. This was the prevailing attitude from the publishers and the few editors Charlton employed. Utter ambivalence. It is fair to say that the publishers literally did not care about the comics they put out. All they cared about was whether a title made a profit or not. It became fairly well known by staff and freelancers that the comic book line was only there to keep the printing presses running between issues of the magazines the company printed. Apparently it was costly to stop and start printing presses, so comic books were added to the printing lineup so the presses could be continually operated 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. To the publishers, that was the extent of their interest in the comic books they printed. They kept the presses running, and that lowered the cost of operation overall. This seems a bit counterintuitive, but it does explain why Carlton paid as little as they did, and why the quality of the comics were quite low. The owners simply didn't care about the comic books they printed. like not even a little. This ambivalence trickled down into the editorial staff, most of whom were business managers more than anything. However, some editors did care, and there were attempts to actually produce interesting material. In 1965, Dick Giordano, who had become an editor at this point, attempted a superhero lineup with the Charlton Action Heroes. This was a slightly ambitious project to expand into the flourishing superhero market, which was an area of publishing that Charlton seemed to avoid. This attempt to create a superhero line was short-lived, though. The action hero comics didn't sell well, and they were all subsequently cancelled. Despite superheroes being the dominant genre at the time, this line probably failed for a few reasons. The most obvious reason is that DC and Marvel dominated the superhero market. Any competition in that genre was going to have a difficult time establishing themselves. This is basically true to this day, and was definitely true in the 60s. It's also possible that audience expectation led to initially low sales. After all, until that point, Charlton almost exclusively published horror, romance, western, and military comics. That was their niche. They published genres that were not well represented by other companies. So producing superhero material that could be easily found elsewhere was of little interest to those that frequently bought Charlton publications. And, of course, there was little or no support from the publishers concerning this superhero expansion. Possibly all of these elements contributed to the eventual cancellation of the Charlton Action Heroes line. The only other notable era of Charlton comics was the early 70s. Under the guidance of assistant editor Nicola Cuddy, a lot of new, notable talent began freelancing for the company. This included Joe Stanton, John Byrne, Mike Zeck, Roger Stern, and Bob Layton all of whom would go on to have great success at Marvel and DC. In fact, Charlton was a company that published a lot of new creative talent over the years. In addition to Steve Ditko and Dick Giordano, there was Denny O'Neill, Tom Sutton, and Jim Aparo, to name a few. So Charlton was a good place for a new artist to begin their career and establish themselves. Charlton allowed the opportunity for new talent to prove they had the skills to pay the bills, and, of equal importance, it allowed that talent to hone their skills while making a modest wage. Furthermore, all the former talent have essentially said the same thing in interviews about their time at Charlton. The pay was low, but they had creative freedom. To a degree, of course. 
they had to stay within the guidelines of the comics code, but otherwise, once they turned in a page, they were done. There wasn't dozens of changes requested by editorial staff once they handed in an assignment. In other words, there was little oversight or interference from editors or the publishers. Following the brief influx of talent in the early 70s, Charlton Comics started to wind down. By 1976, it stopped publishing new material and simply reprinted their back catalog. This continued for almost a decade, and in 1985, Charlton Comics was shut down entirely. The publishing company continued printing magazines until 1991, and then it too was closed down. The printing equipment was ancient and in a state of disrepair, making it impossible for the company to continue as it had been for many, many years. Also, of course, during the 80s, the comic book industry saw the publication of some highly influential work, and there was a dramatic rise of independent publishers also producing quality content. Furthermore, the direct market was also becoming the main avenue for comic book distribution, replacing newsstands as the primary place to find material. Ultimately, Charlton was a company that could not or would not adapt to the changes in the comic book marketplace. Its business model was, essentially, formed in the 50s, and it was a broken, anachronistic system by the 80s. In essence, the comfortable niche that Charlton existed within for many decades simply disappeared. And so did the company. In 1996, the Charlton factory was sold to a real estate developer. The building was torn down, and the land was raised clean. Where there was once a cheap publishing empire, there is now a shopping mall. There's an irony to that that seems both sad and fitting. There is one very unfortunate aspect to this look at Charlton's history, and that is, there are many thousands of pages of original artwork that are lost. Reportedly, the artwork was a disorganized mess, literally thrown into a storage space once it had been reproduced. There was no effort to either preserve it or to organize it in any manner. At one point, due to the volume of artwork they had amassed, the company began to shred the artwork on a regular basis to free up space. Furthermore, it was alleged that shredding became a common practice when the owners heard about the artwork disappearing from the factory and being sold at conventions. While the owners didn't care about the artwork being taken, they did care about someone making money off of their property. So destroying the artwork became a regular practice to prevent this from occurring. Again, I'm unsure whether this is rumor or truth. However, there were sympathetic editors that would occasionally rescue the artwork and return it to its source. Legally speaking, that was theft. But morally, it seems like an easily justified action. Famously, DC purchased the rights to the Charlton Action Heroes in 1983. This was, apparently, a gift for Dick Giordano, who had worked for DC since leaving Charlton in the late 60s. Also well known is the fact that these Charlton Action Heroes were the original characters intended to star in Watchmen. But DC didn't want to break the toys they had just purchased. So the writer, Alan Moore, had to create new characters based on those recently acquired properties. Thus, Captain Adam became Dr. Manhattan. The question became Rorschach, Blue Beetle became the Night Owl, and so on. The only Charlton action hero that wasn't purchased was Peter Cannon Thunderbolt, the rights to which were retained by the creator, Pete Morrissey. Following the demise of Charlton Comics, the publishing rights to all their properties were sold off to any interested parties, the bulk of which was acquired by the Canadian company Avalon Communications. This company is now known as Charlton Media Group, a multimedia firm that has reprinted a variety of older material. However, the copyright to Charlton material may be non-existent. Many of the Charlton titles may, in fact, be public domain. This is due to Charlton not following the requirements of copyright notices in their titles. For the sake of brevity, because I don't want to spend a lot of time delving into this, copyright notices have to be printed in the material one is copywriting. This notice has to adhere to very specific language, and basically, for many of their titles, especially romance comics, Charlton didn't follow the rules, thus their copyright was invalid. Some have researched this point and have found it to be true. Whether it's true for all of their titles is another case altogether. But, on the surface, it appears that almost everything, excluding licensed materials such as The Flintstones and Six Million Dollar Man, is public domain. Of course, trademark on these properties is another rabbit hole, and I think it's best if I sidestep that topic and move on. When the company finally closed its doors, a former employee claimed the Charlton Publishing Venture had organized crime connections. The implication being, from what I could glean, was that Charlton was basically a money laundering service. 
or something. I can't say with certainty what the exact allegation meant, to be honest. Regardless, this claim seems to be unfounded and possibly motivated by the fact that one of the founders, John Santangelo, was an Italian immigrant. Also, Santangelo had a habit of taking trips to the homeland every year, and he'd usually return with some new people that he'd employ at the Charlton factory. Again, it's uncertain how much of this is true and what may be false presumptions based on Santangelo's heritage. Whether any or all of this is valid, it's only worth mentioning because it contributed to Charlton's reputation as an unsavory or sleazy operation. Also, Charlton was the first publisher and printer of Larry Flint's controversial Hustler magazine. This association was short-lived, though. Early on, Flint decided he didn't like the deal he had made with Charlton, and he took his business elsewhere. Again, this is another contributing factor to Charlton's reputation. One aspect of Charlton that needs to be highlighted is that they did publish genres that other, more prominent companies hardly represented, those genres being horror, romance, western, and military comics. They printed a proliferation of romance titles. They were, quite possibly, one of the largest publishers of this genre. I can't say this with certainty, but it was a genre they consistently published from its inception in the late 40s until the early 70s. One other puzzling aspect of Charlton Comics is the numbering on their titles. It seems quite random and nonsensical. For example, the first issue of Captain Adam was number 78. That makes no sense whatsoever for the debut of a new title. However, this numbering system can be explained. Back in the day, when comic companies offered mail-order subscriptions, each title had to be registered, which, of course, cost a fee. It was more cost-effective to simply retitle an existing title, then continue with the prior numbering, and avoid paying the registration fee. In the case of Captain Adam, it had originally been the title Strange Suspense Stories. Charlton changed the title, continued the prior numbering, and saved some money. Another more extreme example is The Thing. The series ran for 17 issues, and then became reprints of Blue Beetle for a few issues, before changing yet again to Mr. Muscles. The only connection any of these titles had was the numbering. By simply changing the title and continuing the number already established, Charlton saved themselves some money. So this practice explains the seemingly inexplicable Charlton numbering system. In the end, as many have noted, Charlton Comics is an effort in lost potential. If the publishers had any ambition, the comic book portion of their business could have been a notable or influential presence in the industry. It was an independent publisher that was capable of becoming a true force during the Silver Age and directly challenging both Marvel and DC. Had there been any noticeable effort, Charlton could have established its presence and grown, possibly becoming an empire. This, more than anything, is why Charlton Comics is an anomaly in comic book history. While there were no shortage of publishers who tried to capitalize on the popularity of comics, very few lasted more than a handful of years. Charlton existed for 40 years, with nothing more than sheer ambivalence towards the product they published. That's it for today. Like, share, subscribe, and comment, and I will talk at you later. Until next time.